Hello everyone! In this next Happy Wheels video, I want to cover the individual level speedrun techniques in the level BMX Park 2. But before I do that, I need to rewind a few videos. Nope, we're going to have to go back farther than that. Holy mother, how long have I been at this? Alright, so there's this trick that you're probably well familiar with if you've played as Irresponsible Dad for even a few hours. If you quickly press left and right in alternation, the vehicle's physics change in some funky ways. I'm in midair and I start alternating left and right slowly. Let's say three inputs per second. You will immediately realize that the bike loses most of its forward speed and it falls much more slowly. A very good use of this trick is to avoid crashing into a wall that's in front of him. If I lean backward, I can even make him drift over to the left slightly and control where I land. Now let's do the same, but this time I will hit left and right at a faster rate. Suddenly, the bike is able to retain most of its forward speed, but it still falls at a relatively slow rate. This is a great way to cross relatively wide distances in the air. Nobody knows why inputting left and right has this effect. Logically, the way that I lean slightly to either side shouldn't have any dramatic effect on my speed when the vehicle is in midair, away from any platform on which I could exert force. A body in motion tends to stay in motion, after all. This exploit probably owes its existence to some weird mathematical error in the programming of Happy Wheels. It appears that this effect was not intentional on the developer's part. The game's creator, Jim Bonacci, was aware of the ability to hover very early on, as is evidenced by this replay description that he wrote in June of 2010. Jim called it a side effect of another mechanic, and indicated that he would not likely remove it in the foreseeable future. Dre was able to discover this one replay description among millions of others by parsing through the files of the Happy Wheels Flash Player archive. Dre has observed that if you quickly input left and right in alternation when starting from rest, the bike will gain a small amount of height. Dre has brought up what I consider to be a pretty solid hypothesis for why this happens. He believes that when the player leans rightward or leftward, a force is applied to the bike to make it move either clockwise or anti-clockwise. This force consists of two components, an upward vector and a horizontal vector. The two vectors are calculated together to a resultant force, which points in a diagonal direction, hence the spinning around of the bike. Let's say I lean left on one frame, and then right on the next frame. When I input right, the bike is still turning anti-clockwise from the previous input. It still has the leftward component of velocity. Now that I'm applying a new resultant vector that points up and to the right, the two horizontal components cancel each other out. But both inputs also have an associated vertical component, which is in the upward direction. Instead of canceling each other out, they add together and give the bike a slight upward impulse. Now, hovering straight up from rest really isn't practical for most uses. Unless if your inputs are absolutely frame perfect, you'll only go up a short distance, then fall back down within two or three seconds. If you have a wall to kick off of, it's possible to go a bit higher. This height is just barely enough to reach the finish line in It Keeps Happening. The way that I see it, it's better not to focus on this hovering phenomenon as giving the bike an upward impulse. Of course, there is some upward force being generated, seeing that the bike is actually able to go upward, but it's the less important of two factors. More importantly, this phenomenon significantly slows down the bike's rate of falling. Look at how slowly the bike falls, in comparison to just letting it fall normally. Inputting left and right seems to, somehow, partially negate the force of gravity. So if I get even a moderate upward impulse from a shape below the bike's wheels, I can conserve that impulse and go up a pretty impressive distance before gravity finally takes over. While the underlying mechanism is not well understood, the effect is very visually apparent. The bike slows down, both in rate of horizontal movement and in falling. I also gain more control of where it lands. Now that's what happens if I lean the bike backward or keep it neutral in orientation. 
If I instead lean the bike forward, the phenomenon gets stranger yet again. Instead of slowing down, the bike actually speeds up in its forward movement. And by a considerable amount, it's possible to gain speeds far faster than the bike's default riding speed. The rate of falling is still slowed down somewhat, though the effect is less pronounced than how it was when I had the bike leaning backward. To get this effect of the bike speeding up, I need to be pressing the buttons moderately quickly. I'm thinking 6 inputs per second is a reasonable estimate. If I do it at a slower input rate, there won't be any significant difference in speed. When I'm leaning forward, the upward portion of the leaning force is directed relatively rightward. Because, of course, the direction that we call upward in this case changes relative to the dad's body. Since this force is directed rightward, this logically contributes to the rightward speed that I'm able to achieve. Now, that's if I just hold up and press left and right in alternation, with no other inputs. There's another method that makes it much easier to retain a high speed. In Happy Wheels, space is the button that activates the bike's brakes. If I hold space while riding along, the bike will immediately come to a halt, killing its forward riding speed. My legs will not rotate on the pedals, even if I continue holding up. It's still possible to lean sideways and fumble around with left and right, though this is quite cumbersome. Clearly, holding space on the ground is not conductive of going fast. Instead of doing that, let's gain a high speed, go up into the air, and then hold space. This is where the magic happens. When I hold space, the range of the bike's rotational movement is restricted to a narrower subset of angles. When I press left or right, the bike will still lean, but it won't lean as far as quickly as it would when I'm not holding space. There are two major advantages to this. When dad hopping in a level, runners try to keep the orientation of the bike at a very specific angle, so that the bike will land in its targeted area on the straightest, quickest path possible. On BMX Park 2, that angle is about 80 degrees clockwise. It is much easier to stay within a narrow range of angles when the bike's range of rotation is restricted. The second advantage of holding space is that it allows the bike to gain much more speed more quickly, even with relatively slow button mashing. To use Adam's word, holding space maximizes the force that is generated by dad hops. The amount of speed that one can get is pretty amazing. When Dre first showed this method to me on a live coaching stream, I was blown away at how much speed I had gained. Yeah, and then it's just uh, being consistent with that much speed. Wow, that is a PB for me by like more than two seconds. I yeah. have never gone that fast on this level. Adam is the god of this level. He, he took it from a can you mash fast to a a skillful can you get a frame perfect switch the reason why holding space increases the speed potential per input is again not well understood that seems to be a recurring theme on this channel if i were to hazard a guess it probably comes back to my old hand waving hypothesis about how the box 2d engine converts between rotational velocity and linear velocity Whenever a character is moving, his speed has both a linear component and a rotational component. When I press left or right, that action changes the value of the rotational component. But because I'm holding space, the bike's rotation is restricted, and it can't fully absorb the potential of the change in rotational velocity. So the bike has this extra remainder of velocity that's going unutilized. To allow this velocity to be expressed, and not to just hold the remainder in limbo, the engine converts it from angular to linear, and this has the effect of increasing the bike's forward speed. I guess. What matters is that it works. The method of holding space is very useful for consistently fast dad hopping. Dre is the runner best known for using this method, though he learned it from watching Adam V 24-7. In his 246.7 demo percent run, Dre got an extremely fast time of 14.96 on BMX Park, and he did it with an average input speed of just 4 inputs per second. Dre has called this method of switching left and right frame perfect. The trick is to release one button and to have the other button held down on the very next frame. The frame-specific transition matters much more than the actual duration for which each input is held. 
If you're holding both left and right at any point, that's bad. That will significantly reduce your speed. If there's a one or two frame window of no inputs between your left and right, that's not as bad. It will still reduce your speed to less than it is with the frame perfect transition. The fact that leaning back and forward quickly can increase my speed to such an extent is weird in its own right, and it may be attributable to a completely different programming quirk. I don't even have to be in the air for this to work. I can quickly scale an inclined platform by leaning forward and wobbling back and forth quickly. Though the exploit has two distinctly different applications, I am going to group them together under a single label, because the method of inputting left and right quickly in alternation is mechanically the same between the two. I've always referred to this technique as wobbling. That's just the name that made the most sense to me. I wobble back and forth on an axis to stay airborne. Pretty simple. I honestly have no idea where I first encountered this vocabulary, but I've been using it for as long as I can remember. I believe that some level creators did actually use the word wobbling in their levels in the very early days of Happy Wheels. I was able to track down one level that I vaguely remember playing. This is Wobble Test by Fluffalophagus. Apparently, the word wobbling is not nearly as widely understood as I had assumed it to be, and I may have made my previous videos needlessly confusing in my insistence to use the term. I couldn't find a single reference to the name outside of that one level that I rediscovered and my own videos, and none of the runners that I asked on Discord said that they used the word themselves. Happy Wheels is a very strange and unique community. Despite the fact that the game had a huge player base of millions of monthly players at its peak, the community has always been very loosely organized. We lack a robust vocabulary. When players need technical words to refer to specific aspects of gameplay, that vocabulary typically comes from one of two sources, the level editor or the community wiki. The wiki simply calls this maneuver hovering in the air. Not a very memorable name. It's so weird to me that wobbling is such an integral part of gameplay in many levels, that tens of millions of players have figured out how to use this method, and yet there's no widely understood name for the technique. I found out that Dre calls this maneuver Dad Hopping, a name that he made up himself. I'm going to call it Dad Hopping from this day forward, because that is just objectively a better name. Goodbye, Wobbling. Dad Hopping can be used in a very wide range of levels to gain speed and preserve height. After Super Mario 64, I think that the next best example of Dad Hopping in a featured level is in BMX Park 2. Runners predominantly use the second method of dad hopping, leaning forward for extra speed. The two speedrunners, Adam V247 and Ewan111, have extensively experimented with this level. They had an intense competition for the individual level record, which Adam ended up winning. They determined that the optimal rate of dad hopping for maximum speed is 30 inputs per second. That is, a frame-perfect input on every single frame for the full duration of the bike's airtime. Obviously, that's not attainable in real-time play. Even the fastest button mashers in the greater speedrunning community tend to max out at 15 inputs per second, sometimes a little higher. The example that I'm using above is by a speedrunner called Leikuki. Now, Leikuki is actually trying to hit two buttons on exactly the same frame. The Happy Wheels example is slightly different, because it involves hitting two buttons on alternating frames. In theory, a Happy Wheels player could hit left on all odd frames, and right on all even frames. Both would average out to 15 inputs per second, which are just barely feasible individually. But that's just not realistic. The inputs would have to be exactly 1 30th of a second out of phase with each other, because if you hit both left and right on a single frame, Happy Wheels actually registers that as a null input. There would be no change in leaning at all registered for that frame. That's possibly part of the reason why holding left and right concurrently kills your speed if you're using the spacebar method. What I'm showing now is a tool-assisted run that I made. How I made this, I opened a bunch of tabs at once, so that the game would slow down to about 8 frames per second. Then I painstakingly pause buffered every single input. With this method, I was able to get up to 25.6 inputs per second. Even at this slowed speed, it may not be possible to achieve a perfect pause buffered input on every single frame. On seemingly arbitrary intervals, the game will sometimes decide to advance two frames at a time instead of one. I also had to lean backward for a few frames at this point to avoid crashing into the floor. 
though it may be possible to avoid that outcome if I can get a more optimal angle off of the halfpipe. It also appears that abusive pause buffering can cause the floor to disappear when the replay is played back. I'm still trying to figure out what could have caused that. Anyway... Happy Wheels also runs at a variable frame rate, which complicates the task further. The game tries its best to output an average of 30 frames per second, but very rarely is the frame rate exactly 30. Sometimes it's 33, sometimes it's 27. The problem is made even worse by the fact that demo percent and all featured levels are played in the Flash version of Happy Wheels. You may not know this, but Flash Player is deeply flawed when it comes to registering inputs. Flash Player only checks which buttons are being pressed at the beginning of every frame. If an input starts after a frame has been rendered and ends before the next frame, Flash Player won't recognize the input. If you want a longer and much more informed explanation of how Flash Player treats inputs, I highly recommend Maximum's recent video on This Is The Only Level. So, it's not realistic to get anywhere near 30 inputs per second in Happy Wheels. To get that level of dad hopping in-game, you'd have to artificially slow down the game. Not only is that disallowed in speedrunning, it completely defeats the purpose of a real-time speedrun such as Demo% Percent. In Adam's Flash Player world record, he achieved a rate of 15.5 inputs per second between both buttons, which is still very fast. That's 51 inputs alternating left and right in the course of approximately 99 frames when he's actively dad hopping. The angle of the bike is also quite sensitive. If you don't lean forward far enough, you won't get the full effect of the speed increase. In the individual level record run, Adam keeps the bike within a range of about 70 to 90 degrees clockwise, if we use a tangent between the two wheels for reference. While 15.5 inputs per second may sound intimidating for most players, you actually don't have to input nearly that quickly to get an extremely fast time on BMX Park 2. The current record is a 13.10, which Adam recently achieved in the JavaScript port. Adam achieved this very fast time with a much more manageable mashing speed of 6.7 inputs per second. He was able to do this because of multiple small optimizations in movement that he discovered. Adam made a whole text guide of this route, which the community has come to call Adam's Manifesto. He goes quite in-depth, talking about the timings of inputs in terms of frames. I'm going to explain what he does in my own words, but I'll show his guide on screen for anyone who wants to see it. Adam immediately leans forward and presses control to eject the child. He throws the child just to get him out of the way. He briefly presses left and then right to perform a small dad hop. The dead hop makes him move forward farther by a small increment, allowing him to get more distance away from the side of the half pipe. He resumes holding right and rotates about 160 degrees clockwise. His head is oriented almost straight down. He's able to effectively fall straight down without touching the left side of the half pipe and getting slowed down by friction. Right as his front wheel is crossing the border between the two boost panes, Adam switches from holding right to holding left. This causes the bike to gradually rotate anti-clockwise. By the time that the bike falls down to the halfpipe, it has rotated the perfect number of degrees for both wheels to be firmly in contact with the floor. As Adam has explained it to me, when both wheels land together, the bike has more traction and it's able to gain speed more quickly. He continues to hold up to accelerate, and left to put pressure on the back wheel. Leaning left slightly allows the bike to maintain more of its speed when going up the ramp. As the bike rotates slightly anti-clockwise, it meets the gradual curvature of the halfpipe. The vector of acceleration is constantly changing to meet the direction that the halfpipe is trying to direct the bike. We don't actually see the front wheel coming up off of the floor, because the bike meets this curvature so well. Dre has called this method a curve boost. If Adam had only held up here and not left, the major portion of his acceleration would be directed straight to the right, and he would have met more resistance. Now, you may realize that Adam is not alternating left and right as he scales the halfpipe. You may think that this makes his ascent slower than it could be. After all, I just stated that alternating left and right to gain speed is a very effective method of scaling a flat inclined ramp. But notice that this halfpipe isn't flat. It gradually curves like a circle or a parabola. 
The curvature offers less resistance at the bottom, and more resistance near the top. This geometry does not seem to allow me to maintain as much speed as I would on a flat incline. It's easier to slip down and lose speed on the left input of the left-right cycle. I've experimented with this method in the level, and I personally do not think that it would be any faster. Maybe the method could warrant further study, but I don't think that it will result in any major breakthrough in the level. It may be as fast as Adam's method, at best. Alright, at approximately this point, the angle of the curvature changes from being more steep to more shallow. As the front wheel passes this point, Adam switches from holding left to holding right. The back wheel comes off from the half pipe and the bike rotates clockwise. Adam holds right for about 9 frames, then he releases. If he were to input nothing here, the bike would continue to rotate clockwise. He presses left to slow down the rotation. By the time that he is ready to start dead hopping in the air, the bike has settled at an angle of about 85 degrees clockwise. He also holds space at this time. Adam claims that holding space in the air limits the bike's range of rotation, and maximizes the force that is generated by dad hops. About three frames after the grind rail falls out of view, Adam starts dad hopping. He tries to keep the timing and length of button presses as consistent as possible, to keep the bike close to the 85 degree angle. If you're not good at judging the angle visually, you can use the method of keeping your head pointed at the tip of the mountain in the background. This angle allows him to fly straight down to the boost panes below. He hits the boost pane right on the front, allowing him to use it to accelerate for the greatest possible length. He holds left to straighten out and hit the floor. Adam actually stops dad hopping at this time. Because he was already going very quickly and the boost pains sped him up even more, he's very close to the fastest possible riding speed. Continuing to dad hop would increase his speed negligibly, if at all. He continues holding left and up as he goes around the loop. His speed is so extreme at this point that there's very little that he can do in terms of movement optimization. He's being pushed right up against the loop. The extreme force even breaks his legs. He releases left so that the bike remains oriented downward. He just barely avoids breaking his head on the bottom of the loop. This maneuver is quite risky. It's safer to lean forward to push his head lower, but this causes the bike to hit the floor earlier, losing the player several frames of airtime. In my older runs, I would actually lean backward to keep my head even farther from the loop, but I would go much slower than Adam in my runs. At his speed, I wouldn't have enough time to rotate far enough anti-clockwise in this narrow area. Once he hits the spikes, Adam just rides up on the back wheel. He probably could have gotten in two or three dad hops here to gain a little bit of speed, but it would have been difficult with the shallow declined angle of the spiked floor. He wouldn't have been able to lean forward far enough to get the full effect of increased speed from dad hopping. Because Adam chose to stay on the floor, his wheels were at the perfect angle to go up this ramp, and then to go into a steep dive past the fan. If he had chosen to dad hop over the spiked floor, it would have been much more difficult to get the precise push off of the ramp. He likely would have been pushed up by the fan, possibly resulting in a net time loss. After Adam misses the corner of the fan, he continues to rotate a little bit more, so he's facing nearly straight down. He dad hops quickly at this steep angle, and he hits the finish line head first. The head first orientation saves a few frames rather than hitting the finish line with one's wheels, because the character's active hitbox is closer to the finish line. This method is still risky, because the spikes sometimes kill the dad before he can activate the win. But it's consistent enough that Dre also suggests practicing it in his demo percent guide. I've noticed that the premature death occurs more frequently if I approach the spikes slowly. The engine checks every frame whether or not I'm within the activation radius of the finish line. The slower I go, the more frames I spend in proximity to the spikes, and there's then a higher likelihood that I'll die on one of those frames, while also not being close enough to activate the win. If you're going at the speed of a top speedrunner, you won't have to worry much about this possible outcome. This is really more of a concern if you're just starting out, and your speed is still slow. The spike death with no win also occurs more often in Flash Player than in the JavaScript port. If you want this end part to be nearly 100% consistent, you can turn backward and hit the finish line with your back wheel, as Dre has done in many of his demo percent runs. And yeah, that's essentially how the run goes. 
Is there potential to bring the record under a 13.1? Certainly. In Adam's current record, there are multiple instances of him holding left and right on the same frame, which certainly cost him a few frames. If he were to clean up those inputs alone and do everything else flawlessly, that may leave the potential for a new record. If he were to combine the precise setup that he developed with faster dad hopping on the level that he achieved in his previous PB of 13.2, it's probably possible to bring the record down by even more frames, perhaps even into the range of a high 12. Now, getting the frame perfect transition between left and right gets more difficult, the faster your mashing speed is. Adam's transitions are remarkably consistent in his old PB of 13.2, a run with a much faster mashing speed. So, the potential is there. Just for comparison, Adam had about 99 frames of dad hopping in his 13.2 without holding space, versus 106 frames of dad hopping in his record of 13.1. So, that's several frames that he can save with faster mashing speed alone. Now, is it realistic to go for a 12 or 13 second BMX park in a multi-level run? Of course not. It's extremely difficult to implement all of these optimizations with near-frame-perfect precision. There's a reason why only three players have even gotten below a 1360. It's hard. But even if you implement maybe half of the possible time saves and you end up with a high 15, that's still more than 10 seconds that you're saving over a player that's going by at a more casual pace. BMX Park 2 is a major source of potential time save in Demo% percent, which is part of the reason why I'm covering it in such detail. The fastest BMX Park that I've seen in a multi-level run is a 14.8, which Ewan achieved in his Demo% percent run. Dre also got a 14.96 in his 246.7 Demo%, percent, and Adam got a 15.36 in his 316 Demo. Each player can experiment with BMX Park and find the combination of optimizations that works best for them at their skill level. You might choose to go for the fast curve boost at the beginning, but then go more slowly on the loop to avoid hitting your head. Dad hopping speeds may vary widely. The route on BMX Park 2 isn't like the mind skip on Trap Track, which is all or nothing. You either go for the mind skip or you don't. I use an average of one of Adam's technique in any one of my runs, because I'm bad at dad hopping. <laughs> Here's an idea. You may even want to try going for this old technique. In my original Demo% percent video, I glossed over this level in all of 35 seconds. Because it just seemed like such a straightforward level, the only detail that I really commented on is that both Dre and Adam chose to run over their child. Unbeknownst to me, this was a legit speedrunning strat. It's called Ewan's Homicide, after the player Ewan111 who popularized it. It was believed that, by pushing off of JB's broken body, the dad is able to gain a small amount of speed. This technique has fallen out of use because the curve boost was found to be faster and... also easier. But hey, it's an option. Wow, this video has turned out to be way longer than I thought it would. Of course, that's happened to every scripted Happy Wheels video I've made since ever. At a certain point, I should probably stop being surprised. Huge thanks go out to Adam for writing out his route in such detail, and for answering the few additional questions that I had. This video wouldn't be anywhere near as thorough without him. I thank Dre as well for personally coaching me to be better in BMX Park 2, so that I could get a feel for many of the techniques that I explain in this video. I intend to continue with the all-featured levels route in my next video. Alright, catch yous later.